Hey everyone, this is Ryan here, and welcome back to our Prostodontic series. And we've talked about a lot so far. In terms of the partial framework, we've talked about the major and minor connectors, the rests, and the proximal plates and the meshwork. And we really have only one thing left to talk about, and that's the clasps and the different kind of designs that they can have, the different sorts of clasps we can select depending on clinical situations. So we'll talk about that, and then that'll be it for removable prosthodontics. So let's get started. So we talked about the indirect retainer in the last video, which is typically a rest that's located anterior and perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And this is the counterpart or the direct retainer. And so the direct retainer is sometimes also called the clasp assembly. And well, there's a lot on this slide. So I want to zoom in to the direct retainer first. And so an example of a direct retainer would be this. And so if we really zoom in there, we can see that there are quite a few components. The rest, which we talked about in detail in the last video, is an actual part of this direct retainer, and it provides support. The minor connector, which we've also talked about, is also part of the direct retainer and it provides stability. And lastly, the clasp arms, which is what we'll be focusing on this video. And there are two different types. There's the retentive clasp arm, which is um, the RA of this uh, image here, retentive arm, and that provides, of course, retention. Whereas we have the reciprocal clasp arm, which is RBA, that stands for reciprocal bracing arm. And this braces against the tooth surface, doesn't necessarily lock in anywhere, but it does brace to provide stability. And so all three of these components, or all four of these components, I should say, make up the clasp assembly or the direct retainer. So the direct retainer can um, look like uh, an extra coronal retainer, which is what we just saw in the previous slide. This is more common, the conventional clasp design, and the clasp should encircle the tooth at least 180 degrees. That's an important number to remember for the board exam. We also have an intra-coronal retainer, or within the crown. And this is a precision attachment with a key and keyway pattern, like in this image. It's more aesthetic because you don't have clasps that wrap around the tooth that you could see from a facial view on Smile. But the intracoronal attachments um, are a little bit interesting and take quite a bit more planning. We mentioned it briefly when we talked about bridges. Uh, we talked about the key and keyway arrangement of pieces that can fit and lock together. The female part would have to be part of a crown called a survey crown, which is specifically designed to be used as the abutment tooth for a partial, and with it would have the rest seats and everything built into that tooth. And then this uh, male part would have to be part of the framework of the partial. But otherwise, we're going to focus mostly on extra coronal retainer design. So let's talk about one of the uh, two types of clasps the retentive clasp to start. And this one is going to originate from the minor connector and the rest. And so this is a nice way, a very cool way, I think, to divide the tooth up into occlusal, middle, and gingival thirds. And each of these thirds offers, generally, one of these three buzzwords. The occlusal third offering support, the middle third offering uh, stability or stabilization, and the gingival third providing retention. So um, the contact of this retentive clasp should be purely the tip and the, the last third of this clasp, and it should contact the tooth below its height of contour. In the world of prosthodontics, it can be called the survey line. And so remember the height of contour from dental anatomy. This is um, the line of the tooth that represents basically where it sticks out the most. 
where the contour of that tooth is greatest in a direction outwards. So for this tooth, this line here dividing the middle and gingival third might very well represent the height of contour for this tooth. And so you want this retentive tip of this retentive clasp to contact under the height of contour, because that means anything underneath this height of contour is going to be further indented in, and there'll be an undercut going along here. So if you want this clasp to kind of click into place, you want that tip to engage underneath the height of contour. Now the rest of this clasp, including the shoulder, which is this first third, and the middle third, if we can divide the clasp up into thirds so you can get a better view of what I'm talking about, these two thirds should be above the height of contour, whereas the tip should be the only part engaging underneath it. And the tip is again designed to engage in what's called an undercut and resist dislodging forces. Now the tip should only be active when dislodging forces are applied to them, otherwise they seat passively. Basically what this is saying is that when the partial is in place and fully seated, when you try to dislodge the partial, that's when this tip should engage in the undercut and provide a bit of uh, resistance to dislodging forces, which one of our buzzwords, that's what we call as retention. That's what we know as retention. So that's how the retentive, cl the retentive clasp provides retention because we have an engagement of the retentive tip in the undercut area. Now the retentive clasp is generally located on the buccal surface of the tooth. That's how, based on how the height of contours tend to go, but if you have a tooth that's tipped buccally or tipped lingually, sometimes you might have to swap which side the retentive clasp is on and which side the reciprocal clasp is on. So we also what we call it as the reciprocal bracing arm or sometimes called the stabilizing clasp. That's because it provides stability. And so this one again is going to originate from the minor connector and the rest area. And this one is going to contact the tooth above the height of contour, also known as the survey line. And that's every part of this clasp. So we don't want any part, including the tip, to be contacting underneath the height of contour. Again, we can draw it in. This very well might be, at least in this image, it seems like they're, they're sticking with the height of contour being this line between the gingival and middle thirds. But this depends on which tooth, the specific patient's tooth anatomy, uh, and a lot of other factors. So part of partial design is determining where this height of contour or survey line is for each tooth that you're considering to be an abutment tooth. And once you have that information, you know how to design the clasp. For example, this one, we want it always to be above the height of contour because we don't want it engaging in any undercuts. That's not the purpose of this clasp. It's simply to provide bracing against the abutment tooth so it's not torqued by the retentive clasp. When you have the retentive clasp actively engaging that tooth as, it's trying, as the partial is trying to be dislodged, you have this one on the opposite side, mostly uh, on the lingual surface of the tooth, uh, and it's providing bracing forces to resist any movement of that tooth that could be torqued in, uh, say, for this example, in a lingual direction. So when we have the retentive and the reciprocal clasps on opposite sides of the tooth, now we're starting to look at what could potentially be uh, a very nice clasp design. So clasp designs can be categorized in two main categories. We have supra bulge, which means they originate above the survey line, which is much of what we've been looking at. Some examples of these are the circumferential or the acres clasp, ring clasp, combination clasp, and brazier clasp. And the infra bulge category are all the clasps that originate below the survey line. And these are lots of different bar type designs. And let's look at some pictures of all of these. So the circumferential or acres clasp is perhaps the most commonly used clasp. And whenever in doubt, 
on the board exam. Um, this would be my guess if they were asking you about a particular type of clasp. I would guess Acres clasp because, again, it's the most commonly used design by far. And so this is going to refer to both the retentive clasp arm and the reciprocal clasp arm together as a unit. So now think of um, prior to this, we were talking about individual clasp arms, and now we're talking about the entire direct retainer as a unit. So the acres clasp is ideally used um, in, well, a lot of different scenarios. It's very versatile. And notice how both clasp arms are originating above the survey line. The retentive clasp is originating up where the minor connector meets the rest. And also on the lingual surface, it's doing the same thing. It's the uh, reciprocal arm is originating above the survey line. And that means that this is a super bulge clasp design because it's originating above the bulge, above the height of contour. The ring clasp is used when an undercut is adjacent to the bounded edentulous space. You notice how these clasps, when they originate from this part of the framework, they have to engage in this retentive clasp has to get, engage in an undercut that's on the opposite side of this bounded edentulous space here. doesn't matter for the reciprocal clasp because it's not engaging in an undercut, but it is important for the retentive clasp. So say we didn't have an undercut on the surface opposite, and we had an undercut that was right next to the bounded edentulous space. That's when a ring clasp would come in. So let's say, for example, this did not provide a good undercut, and an acres clasp wouldn't work. It wouldn't have an undercut to engage in, whereas this one is a great undercut to do. So the ring clasp wraps around the entire tooth. Sometimes there's just the one rest here. Sometimes there's even a second rest here. And other times yet, there's an auxiliary arm that comes out from the meshwork to support this ring clasp. So it's a very interesting design, uh, probably most commonly used for molars where you can't get an adequate undercut. And say the undercut was on, again, the distofacial or the distolingual, you could just use an acres clasp. But since the undercut is in the mesiofacial area for this patient, we need a ring that wrapped around the entire tooth. And then the retentive tip then dives down and engages the undercut on that side. So next we have the embrasure clasp, and this is essentially two acres clasps that go between the two teeth and then encircle both of them. So you need to have rests on both of these teeth so that the clasps don't wedge the teeth apart over time. So the rest, again, is providing that resistance to vertical seating forces and makes it so that we're not torquing these teeth um, towards the lingual also, what the reciprocal clasps are doing are helping brace that te brace those two abutment teeth so that they're not being torqued towards the lingual direction. All right, so those were some examples of super bulge clasps that originate above the survey line. So let's see infra bulge clasps because these ones are not originating from up here and swinging downwards. They're originating from down way below the survey line and coming up to meet their um, retentive undercuts. So you can see how much different the infra bulge clasps are in comparison. So this one here is the T bar. This one is the modified T bar or the R bar design. And it's basically just because of how they look. You can see this one sort of forms a T. This one sort of forms this lowercase r. So here are two infra bulge clasp designs. Again, they originate below the survey line, below the height of contour of these teeth. And uh, let's talk about yet another one. This is an I bar. And this one again is basically representing the letter I because it's a straight line up and down. And so this is another infra bulge clasp that originates below the height of contour. The clasp arm is 
actually originating from the meshwork of the framework. Now, some important considerations. Why don't we just use this for all the teeth because it's more aesthetic, right? You don't see the clasp as easily when it's hiding down here along the soft tissue. Well, you need enough vestibular depth to house this type of bar type clasp. And you can't have a soft tissue undercut because if you did, the clasp could get locked into the soft tissue, which would be quite uncomfortable and traumatic for the patient. So there are a couple situations where this just wouldn't fly and wouldn't be the ideal uh, clasp to use. All right, so we've talked about a bunch of different clasps and clasp designs. Now we have some particular clasp assemblies, and this is referring to the whole direct retainer. We talked about all the components, the rest, minor connector, uh, both or at least all of the clasp arms included. And so here are some handy names to remember. The RPI stands for rest, proximal plate, which again is a specific type of minor connector, and I for eye bar. And so we talked about um, we talked about rests, we talked about proximal plates, and we just talked about the eye bar infrabulge clasp design. So the class two lever system is basically attained by having the rest be on the mesial side of the tooth rather than the distal side. But that's kind of beyond the scope of this video and the, the board exam for that matter. So maybe just know that this offers an ideal class two lever system. And that's because again, the rest is on the mesial side rather than the distal side here. The RPA stands for rest, proximal plate, and acres clasp. And RPC stands for rest, proximal plate, and circumferential clasp, which is synonymous with acres clasp. So these are essentially two names for the same thing. And this here would represent, uh, well, this isn't an I bar because it doesn't come down uh, infrabulge. This would most likely represent, it's not exactly an acres clasp, but we'll call this an acres clasp. So this would be uh, mesial rest, proximal plate, and A for acres clasp. So that's what this would be. So clasp selection is very important when you're talking about treatment planning and how you're going to design a partial before it's delivered. And we have this um, concept I haven't talked about yet called the wrought wire. And wrought wire is basically more flexible than a typical clasp design that we've seen uh, previously. And it's separately positioned and soldered onto the metal framework. So it, it, the nice thing about it being more flexible is that it puts less torque on teeth. So it's um, recommended for periodontally compromised and endodontically treated teeth, because these are already teeth with some trouble, not ideal for abutment teeth. And so we wanna put a little bit less pressure on those and use wrought wire instead. Now why I said this was sort of an RPA, not quite, is because this is an example of a wrought wire. You can see how it's separate from the rest of the metal and it's been soldered and positioned separately. So this is an example of a wrought wire clasp. So wrought wire used for these compromised teeth. Bounded edentulous space, ideally use acres clasps with rest seats located adjacent to the edentulous space. This is very common. Again, why acres clasps are so common is because they just really work in a lot of different scenarios. Bounded edentulous spaces most often will use these. And for distal extension, you want to use in order of preference the RPI, which is rest proximal plate I bar, RPA, and wrought wire. Those are the top three choices for the clasp design adjacent to a distal extension area. All right, and lastly, I just wanna cover the material that framework is made out of. We've been talking about the framework for so many videos now. Let's just talk about what material it's made out of. It's made out of cobalt chromium, and this uh, metal alloy uh, has 2.3% shrinkage which causes some irregularities and porosity in the material, 
but it's very strong, uh, great material to be used. Cold working is sometimes known as plastic deformation or work hardening, and this involves manipulating the metal while at ambient temperature. Essentially, the clasp assembly is cold worked every time it's seated and dislodged. Every time a patient puts that partial in, takes it out, puts it in, takes it out, the clasps, particularly those retentive tips that engage the undercuts, are cold worked a little bit. And this is why the clasps break. It's the main reason why clasps break is, called, is because of cold working. And that could definitely be a question on the board exam, so I definitely remember that one. And uh, cobalt chromium, again, is a good framework material, but it does come with some shortcomings, particularly in terms of the clasps breaking. All right, so that's it for removable prosthodontics. We talked about a lot in this video and in the series so far. So uh, go ahead and rewatch some of this if you feel like you need a second glance, and we'll move to fixed prosthodontics next in the series, and then we'll finally finish with some practice questions covering all the things we've talked about so far so that we can kind of bring it all together and make sense of all of it as a collective unit. So thank you so much for watching, everyone. Thanks for staying tuned to this video, and we'll see you all in the next one.